Hello all, and welcome to my presentation on introducing an optimization and explicit run to cut-a-based approach, or ORCA, to perform dynamic flux balance analysis, DFDA. My name is Wheaton Schroeder. I'm a PhD student in uh, the Systems and Synthetic Biology Laboratory at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, advised by Dr. Rajiv Saha. So uh, I'd like to just begin by saying that if you find this talk interesting, uh, you can see it in scientific reports in a peer-reviewed uh, journal article. So we'll start by talking about genome scale modeling and dynamic flux balance analysis uh, and some of the limitations of current uh, DFBA techniques. Uh, we'll then introduce the optimization in Rangicata or ORCA-based approach to DFBA. Uh, then we'll discuss ORCA being applied to a model of Arabidopsis. Uh, and then finally, we'll summarize uh, the contents of this video and talk about some of our ongoing and future work. So to begin with, uh, let's discuss DFDA. So genome scale models are reconstructed through an iterative process uh, by which we search publicly available databases to produce a list of reactions which the species might be able to catalyze. We then make sure that those reactions are element and charge balanced and create a biomass equation for those reactions in order to simulate growth. Uh, then we assemble a genome scale model of metabolism, uh, which might look something like this, where you have reactions, metabolites, and a stoichiometric matrix with limits on reaction rates. Uh, and then we repeat this reconstruction process to have our in silico results agree more with in vivo data. So one of the most common uh, analysis approaches to take when using a genome scale model is flux balance analysis. There are two primary kinds of flux balance analysis. So there's just sort of this ordinary linear flux balance analysis, which utilizes the pseudo state, uh, sorry, pseudo steady state assumptions. Uh, and it's simple to implement, quick to solve, and it works well for micro. Uh, it's basically just solving a series of linear problems. Uh, the limitations here are that it's uh, difficult to implement for complex systems, especially when we're trying to model uh, growth we can't model things over time, and it's difficult to model non-exponential growth. On the other hand, dynamic flux balance analysis uh, is solving a series of interrelated ordinary differential equations uh, where we're solving for concentration uh, over time. It gives greater accuracy potentially than, than FDA. Uh, the models can be time dependent and at least in our opinion, it better models complex systems. Now the limitation is that DFDA is more complex to implement. Uh, it can have numerical stability issues, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and it can be more difficult to solve. There are two current approaches to DFDA, and uh, they're either limited by computational power or accuracy. The static optimization approach, or SOA, uh, solves in a step-by-step -step manner where each time point builds on the solution of the time point previous to it. It's easy to implement and requires only linear programming. However, it's limited because it uses first-order Taylor series approximations uh, throughout, which causes uh, the order of the error to be second order. So basically, the error is on the order of magnitude of whatever your time step is squared. Um, so when we were first modeling Arabidopsis, which is our test system here, and applying the SOA approach, we were experiencing problems with solution stability. The other approach is the dynamic optimization approach, or DOA. Uh, DOA solves for all points simultaneously. Uh, it's more accurate and the solution is more stable. However, it requires nonlinear programming and is difficult to implement. Uh, and one of the downsides of nonlinear programming is that we can't guarantee that we're finding an optimal solution. So that's another additional drawback to the DOA approach. Uh, it's very problematic for large models and large time sets, uh, which we would like to model over. So uh, we decided to uh, improve the static optimization approach. Uh, to make the optimization and run to cut a based approach to the FBA or ORCA. Uh, so what ORCA does is it solves on a step-by-step -step manner. So we have 
uh, this outer workflow loop in blue of time set, and this inner workflow loop of the run to cut a set. Uh, and this allows us to solve in a step by step manner where each solution builds upon previous solutions and still utilizes linear programming to solve ODEs. However, we're able to get a lower error floor. Uh, so we're able to get at least um, magnitude of whatever our time step is to the third power. Uh, we're able to use multiple different kinds of run to cut a method in order to, to tune our numerical stability. We're able to produce a higher accuracy solution and we're able to have higher stability across a large number of time points. <clears throat> so one of the bene real benefits of the of, of implementing run to cut a method is there's many of them, uh, which can be shown in uh, sort of a, a butcher tableau uh, way. So here are just five example um, run to cut a methods which would actually work with the ORCA approach. The only restriction that ORCA places well, the only two restrictions that ORCA places on the run to cut a method selection is one, it has to be explicit, and two, uh, the step values have to be evenly spaced. And this is for reasons or order of error. Because in addition to solving ODEs, we use trapezoid rule based integration as well uh, in this algorithm. So this requires evenly spaced time points or has a lower error with evenly spaced time point. So our error order is now uh, whatever those whatever that space is between uh, the C values times our time step to the power of three. So this gives us a much lower error floor than time step to the power of two, provided we take a small enough time step. So then we applied ORCA to our Arabidopsis model. So as I discussed before, genome scale models are an iterative process of model building. Uh, so we actually applied this iterative process four times to make models of the leaf, stem, seed, and roots of Arabidopsis. Uh, so we're modeling the Arabidopsis plant as just these four tissues. We're also looking at just the core carbon metabolism because we're most interested to see how ORCA performs. So um, <clears throat> we have our leaf model, which func which uh, serves the function of gas exchange and photosynthesis, as well as a source for many um, carbon-based compound syntheses. We have our root model, which is actually our smallest model, uh, but it functions for exchange of nutrients with soil, for nitrogen reduction, tri uh, respiration, and transport. Our seed model represents a metabolic cost to the organism, uh, basically what the cost that's incurred by reproduction, uh, and it also serves as a storage of um, metabolites. Finally, we have our stem model, which logically links all three of the other tissues together uh, and serves for uh, transportation, respiration, and storage. So ORCA is applied to this multi-tissue model of Arabidopsis, so now our Arabidopsis model is our input to our, our to our ORCA workflow. Uh, in total, the Arabidopsis model contained uh, about 1,250 metabolites, 1,150 uh, total reactions, and 773 genes. So we called this Arabidopsis model the PATH 773 model. Uh, <clears throat> now, because not all tissues are present at all times and in the same ratios at all stages of Arabidopsis growth. What we did was we broke down Arabidopsis growth into seven distinct life stages. Uh, so we have seed germination, uh, the transition from seed germination to leaf development, where we are hanging on to some of the uh, uh, seed source. We have leaf development, leaf development to, to flower production transition, flower production, flower production to silicry ripening transition. Uh, silicry is the uh, seed pods of Arabidopsis. And then finally, silicry ripening, uh, where the Arabidopsis plant actually starts to uh, die off. So we're modeling the full life cycle of Arabidopsis from the emergence of the radical all the way to desiccation of the plant. Uh, so this gives us 
something more um, comprehensive than any other DFDA model of Arabidopsis to date. So comparing to the previous best DFDA, uh, we see that we are modeling uh, almost twice as long in terms of time period. Our time steps are a quarter the size. Uh, we're using the improved ORCA method, which decreases our error compared to uh, the previous batch, which used the static optimization approach. Uh, we are including more growth stages. So we have seven growth stages compared to the previous best two. And we're modeling four tissues compared to the previous best two. So we think this represents a real step forward in the application of BFDA to plant systems. <clears throat> so when we applied our DFDA, uh, we didn't have a lot of information about the reaction scale, how the reaction scale behaves. So what we did instead is we constrained the plant scale behavior. So we constrained things like, um, uh, say, biomass yield, uh, what mass the tissue should be at at certain time points so that we could figure out what the growth rate needs to be for that. Um, we had some information about the rate of carbon dioxide and oxygen usage. So we constrained whole plant behavior. So that's just what this is showing is that uh, our in silico target growth points met in vivo growth data. Uh, because we constrained the, uh, the plant scale behavior, we studied then the reaction scale behavior uh, to see what novel conclusions we could draw from our system. So we studied two different uh, reaction systems across all four of the tissues. The first is we studied uh, sulfur metabolism, and the second we studied water flow. Uh, so sulfur metabolism, the direction of everything was largely as, ex as expected. Um, sulfur containing, but one of the interesting things that we found is that sulfur containing amino acids, because they are co-transported uh, with other metabolites, uh, they were sometimes used to indirectly transport other metabolites, especially in the earlier growth stages. <clears throat> As for water flow, we saw strong diurnal patterns. Uh, so basically we saw about two or three orders of magnitude higher flow of water uh, in daylight than we did at night. Uh, so that sort of recreates um, the water patterns that we see in a living organism. Uh, but we were all, we were surprised to see that, uh, metabolism actually contributed a large fraction of the water that was transferred. Uh, I think in our model, it showed, uh, roughly about 70% of the water that was transferred was, uh, due to metabolism. Now we think this number is a little high because we only modeled core metabolism and we only modeled transpiration as water loss. Um, but we still think that uh, there is definitely significant metabolic contribution to transpired water. Um, so in, in summary, we were able to develop a new and flexible approach to DFDA, which we continue using various forms of cutter methods. And we were able to apply it to a four tissue life cycle model of Arabidopsis thaliana. Our ongoing work is that we're hoping to apply a, a plant orca to a multi-tissue life cycle model of agricultural crops. Um, currently right now we're working on applying this to ZMAs. Uh, in future, I'm hoping to apply it to Coffea Arabica, which is the source of Arabic coffee. So if you want to uh, check out my uh, faculty candidate poster present, sorry, presentation, you can see that there. Uh, I would like to thank my advisor, uh, Dr. Ji Saha, for all the advice he's given on this work, as well as our funding source, which is a faculty startup grant from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So this is the Systems and Synthetic Biology Group at UNL. Uh, and I would like to thank you all. Uh, thank you all for your time and watching this presentation. If you have any questions for me, you can address them to me via the iPoster platform while the uh, conference is still going, or via YouTube comments, if you feel like it. Uh, or via email to the email uh, listed below.